We're live. Hey. Hi. Hello. What a joy to be here with you guys. Hey, hey. I've been here and I'm, I'm just a straggler. You're back. You saw the end of that movie. Was it, was it any good? It was some little indie film. It was, it was all right. It had its moments. Well, we're talking about indie films today. We're talking about uh, probably the biggest indie film ever made in terms yeah. of balls on it. And um, I think one of the more important ones of the past 20 or 30 years easily <laughs> um, and George has a tradition with indie films. I love the fact that there's a guy who put his entire fortune behind something he believed in and yeah. had a vision for the future of how stories should be told. Um, and he did it his way. And it's going to be awesome to talk about this today with, uh, the three of you, we've got a few other people joining and I guess now I'm somehow a moderator in this. Yeah, um, well, you're, 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 <laughs> you're doing great. Keep can going. I curse? Can I fucking curse? Am I allowed to curse? I don't know. Um, so we've got now. Yeah, just say, they would have I shut me down. Out, so, uh, so we've got uh, Claire, uh, Grant. Claire Grant, and Claire, Claire you've got, you got some affiliation uh, with Star Wars during the prequel era. You played an amazing bounty hunter on the Clone Wars, and you've been you were married, married at Skywalker, Skywalker Ranch. Ranch. I was, and Ahmed was there. <laughs> I was there. Yeah. Very cool. And we've also, also got, got Ahmed, Ahmed Best. Best. I mean, this, I mean, this is. is uh, Jar Jar Binks, Binks. and Woo-hoo! my nieces, my nieces and, nephews and nephews were growing up. It was like, like watching them discover, discover this character, character and, and collect your toys and, and fall in love with Star Wars. Wars. And, and in in the in the, in the way, way it's meant to be, the hope, hope the positive, positive yeah. the joy, an innocent character. character. Um, it was just like a special thing watching them fall in love with Star Wars the way I fell in love with Star Wars as a kid, and you being the the man behind something that reminded people that Star Wars was for everyone and it didn't need to be cynical and age with us, that Star Wars was mm-hmm. you know, for the seven-year-old and everybody. And I just, right. I love the character. I love what you did through those movies. So it's, it's great that you're here today to talk with us. Um, Thank you. I appreciate cool. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. And I was at Claire's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I was not because I had not met yet, but but I would have been. <laughs> and we've got Jen Nero here. Now, Jen is an amazing writer. And Jen, I don't know if you guys have seen these out there, uh, The Forces of Destiny, uh, among other things, non Star Wars. Mm-hmm. But uh, I met you at Star Wars Celebration 2017. Yes. That's when oh, I met the whole family. It was a. It was great, man. I, I just I gained a whole Star, Star Wars family like 15 in one day. And we, had and we so still have our thing. We still have you our thing. You were like teasing and launching Forces of Destiny. Yes, yes. And so me and Janina Gabankar, we, we were announcing like within hours of each other, she was Battlefront 2 and I was Forces of Destiny. We were at different panels and we had met that weekend and our, my life has never been the same. And yeah, that was pretty fun because we couldn't talk about it yet. And I think it dropped at midnight that night. And I was with Dave Filoni and Sam Whitworth. And I had not known they had filmed this kind of trailer thing that Kathleen Kennedy did with her. I was like, oh my God. I was like, ah, it was, it was really trippy. So that was, uh, that was great. And then I think they all went to party and we hung out at the bar and you had a, you had a soda and I had a martini and we chatted. It was great. I had some Star Wars soda. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, being down there, uh, one thing is like the community of Star Wars. I think the, the, when people come together to celebrate it and obviously there's celebration, which honors it, which mm-hmm. is this incredible, uh, pilgrimage for Star Wars fans from all over the world. I mean, you made the last one, which was, which was great to see you there. Yeah. And, um, I just think that's what, that's what happened with episode one. It was a rallying call for everyone to come out from wherever they were hiding to come back to this franchise because it was on the cusp of becoming a cult film in the, uh, you know, later in the eighties, early nineties, George had kind of mothballed the idea of making it. He, he said he wasn't going to mm-hmm. do it. Um, and then he started to tease that was happening and he did the, the special editions and people started to galvanize behind it. And there was this uprising um, and Star Wars got its place in the limelight again. And there was a paranoia that set into the zeitgeist building up towards episode one. And I think that for me was the most important thing that had awakened me was the community that all these people yeah. from different generations, different walks of life had been affected by this thing on a spiritual level, on a, on a craft level. So many people became filmmakers because of it. I became a filmmaker, um, I'd say solely because of Star Wars and, and uh, the magic yeah. of what George 
you know, created the way he told stories and the way he desired to tell stories with people. So that was like this, this community. And episode one was this, um, you know, explosion of Star Wars in, in, in front and center. Now, Ahmed, did you, you obviously, um, I know you were doing some, some, I was in New York at the time. I'd heard about you. You were performing in New York and then you got this incredible gig. Did you, did you know what you were doing? Yeah. No, I had no idea. Um, so I was doing a show called Stomp in New York. Yeah. And Stomp is like found uh, object percussion and all, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's like really physical comedy, physical storytelling. And I had been in Stomp for about like a year. Um, and then I went out on tour. Um, and we were in San Francisco. And, you know, the funny thing about getting the audition for Star Wars in San Francisco was I was the lead of the show in Stomp. But the night that Robin Gerlin came to see Stomp in San Francisco, I was overthrown <laughs> and put in the back line of the show. One of the guys who had seniority over me um, came into San Francisco. And what happened was one of, the, one of our cast members got really violently ill, right? They had to go. He was in the hospital and they sent him home, right? And so we were like, we got to get somebody from New York to come in and cover. So the guy who flew in from New York was in the show longer than I was. And he was kind of like big man on campus, right? Oh. So, and he was from San Francisco. So he was like, you know what, Ahmed, tonight I'm leading the show and you're going to play this other role. And it wasn't a role, I, I played the role like, what, like eight months ago. So I hadn't, I had, I had to like, remind myself of the role and and I was just like nah man like if you're ever in anything theater when you're on a roll with the cast you're firing on all cylinders you know how everybody thinks you in everybody's head right you know exactly what's gonna happen if something goes wrong right and so that cast that I was on tour with was my cast right yeah Sam Hi. <laughs> ah, what's happening? <laughs> keep talking, keep talking. I want to hear. Okay. So the cast that I was on tour with was my cast, right? We knew each other, like we knew everybody, what everybody was gonna do. We were so incredibly tight. So here comes this dude from New York, and he's just like, nah, man, you ain't leading the show. And so I was 22, 23 years old, and I was an asshole when it came to my cast. <laughs> I was like, I am going to either lead this show or everybody's getting destroyed on stage. I'm like destroying this whole thing. And I'm going to make sure that everybody in the audience knows this is my show and my cast, right? So this other role that I had to play was like a lot less acting and a lot more drumming, right? And I'm a drummer. Like I've, I've been a drummer since I was a kid. And this cat that came from New York, he was more an actor than he was a musician. Like he couldn't hang with me playing drums. I kind of did it all like on a, on a higher level, right? So I was like, I'm gonna torch this dude. Like in every, <laughs> every number that we gotta do, I'm gonna play it twice as fast and twice as hard. And he'll never be able to keep up. And like we, there's this role, there's a, a piece in Stomp called Suspension where we like, we're up on a fence, we're like 50 feet above stage and we're playing like all of these different kind of, you know, instruments like fire extinguishers and, and trash cans and it's like all on this grid, right? And we're swinging like mountain climbers, right? So usually suspension is like at a nice little tempo. It's like, ding, 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 ding. It sounds like a samba, right? I played it like 10 times faster than that, right? <laughs> Because it was my cast, <laughs> all I had to do was look at them and they knew how to follow me, right? I knew everybody's strength. So I knew how fast everybody else could play, right? And the most complicated parts were my part and his part. And I was like, I'm just gonna fucking destroy this dude. So I was just like <laughs> and he was looking at me, sticks were dropping, shit, he looked like an asshole. And like everybody was looking at me like, oh man, I met his on one tonight, right? I was pissed. <laughs> End of the show, right? There's this, there's this part called Encore, and I'm just playing a trash can. 
right? And usually it's kind of a quiet moment where the leader of the show comes out and does the clap, clap, call and response with the audience, right? I'm standing, I'm not doing it, right? I got thrown in the back. I walk to the front of the stage while he's trying to like get everybody's attention in the audience. I take off my shirt and I throw it in the crowd, right? And like, girls started screaming like I was a rock star. It was like, oh my God, Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's what's going down tonight. That's how, you know what I'm saying? I was pissed, walked backstage, right? And I was like, I felt really bad after the show, right? I felt terrible because I completely like embarrassed this dude. And the, it kind of dawned on me after the show that I was kind of being a dick. So I was like, man, I felt terrible. So I'm in the dressing room and one of the other cast members, RJ comes in and he goes, hey, I'm Ed. And I'm just like, look, man, don't talk to me, right? I'm upset, okay? I know I messed up. I know I had to tell the show. I know I made him look stupid. I let my ego take over. I know, all right, just don't talk to me. And he goes, no, I had a guest in the audience. And I was like, word? He's like, yeah. Her name is Robin, and she's casting the new Star Wars movie. And I was like, oh. And I was like, I thought she was there to see RJ. Right? And I messed it up for RJ. Because I torched everybody. Like, there was nobody that could hang with me that night. Like, everybody got crushed. Right? And I was just like, man, RJ, oh, I'm sorry, bro. Like I messed up your, I messed up your shot. And he was like, nah, she wants to talk to you. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? After that show? Like after I did all of that, I'm looking like a, a dummy up there for 90 minutes. And he was like, yeah, go back to the hotel and she's gonna call you at the hotel. And I was like, is it gonna get weird tonight, RJ? Like, am I, is there, what's this gonna happen? Is something weird gonna, like this, go back to the crib. So I walk up the, you know, San Francisco is like this. So I'm walking back up <laughs> to the hotel. I'm like, I don't know what's about to happen. Robin calls me, is this I'm Yeah, work. She was like, I want you to drive the Skywalker Ranch and audition for the Star Wars movie. I was like, what words are you saying right now? Like, I don't even believe any of this language, right? So I rent a car and you know, I don't know if y'all been to Skywalker. I know Claire's been to Skywalker, but if you've ever been to Skywalker, them roads are like this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like every curve is a sidewinder curve. So I'm driving up the Skywalker like, <laughs> I can't believe this shit is happening. Like, what is, what am I doing, right? And I get to the, to the gate and, and you know, they're like, before I can be like, hey, I'm my man. They were like, hey, Mr. Best of Kling. And the fucking thing opens. I drive into the, you know, you see the booth and then you see the firefighter with the X-wing patch, right? <laughs> and I was like, what's happening? <laughs> you know, I see the dude with the X-wing patch and he's like, oh yeah, they respected you go up to the main house. I drive up to the main house. You know, you see the, the Victorian joint, it opens up. And I walk up the steps and Robin is there. She's like, hey, how you doing? Uh, pleasure to meet you. You had a great show last night. And I was like, no, thank <laughs> you very much. And then <laughs> we walk in and we walk through the main joint. And then the first thing I see is the cabinets on either side. It has Indiana Jones with his hat and then the, 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 the lightsabers, right? And the, the OG lightsabers from A New Hope. And I'm trying not to freak out, right? Because <laughs> what Robin didn't know at the time was A New Hope was the first movie I ever saw. I'd seen a movie in a the movie theater before New Hope, right? And I was like three when it came out. So I grew up with Star Wars. I had, you know, I grew up in the South Bronx. We didn't have very much, but I was such a huge Star Wars fan that my mom went to the fabric store and bought Star Wars fabric and made curtains, sheets, pillowcases, pajamas for me and my brother. Like we were just dumb Star Wars fans. So I'm 
freaking out about this. We go in the basement in Robin's office and her office was like mad narrow, right? And she was like, okay, you're gonna audition for this, but there's no script. I can't tell you who you are. I can't tell you what you're doing. And I can't tell you why. So go, audition now. That sounds familiar. Action. And I was like, what? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? And so she goes, okay, I'm just gonna put you through some, some things. I want you to crawl on the ground, really close to the ground like a salamander, and then pick something up like you're eating it, and then look around, and then you get hit by something huge, and then you gotta go, oh no, and then fall. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And this turned out to be the first Jar Jar scene in Phantom Menace, right? Yeah. So I was like, okay, I did this whole thing, right? And she was like, that's great. And I was like, really? She was like, no, it's really great. I was like, word? She was like, okay, I'll do whatever you want, right? And so I do a bunch of different martial arts. So in this narrow hallway, I was doing like backflips and like kicks and, you know, just moving because it was all about the movement, right? This was this whole thing. I didn't know it was mocap, you know, but by the same token, they didn't know it was mocap either. Like they had no idea whether this thing was gonna work or not. Like this was the first motion capture feature film where a main character was gonna be a motion capture. So everything was like, I don't know, to like do stuff. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so I just did stuff, right? And they were like, okay, cool, thank you. And so I did a tour of the ranch and everything. And then I went back on tour. And I was like, wow, that was really fun. I hope something happens, but if it doesn't, that was really fun, right? Two weeks later, I'm in DC, right, on tour. I get a phone call, it's Robin. And she's like, hey, can you come back to San Francisco for a screen test? And I was like, bet. I told my, my company manager, I was like, yo, I gotta go back to San Fran, this movie thing I gotta do. I can't tell you what it is. I can't tell you when it is. I can't tell you why, but I gotta go back San Francisco, is that okay? And they were like, yeah, sure, go. So I flew back to San Francisco <laughs> and I stayed at the ranch. The ranch at night is dark. <laughs> so I was real nervous for the screen test. So I went to the gym while it was the daytime and I was like shooting baskets and stuff and just chilling and making sure that I was cool and relaxed, right? And then I took one of them, you know, those beach bikes that they have at the ranch. So I was like on one of them beach bikes. And then um, it was the nighttime. And I was just like, <laughs> how do I get back to where I'm staying, right? And so I had to call one of the X-Wing dudes, be like, hey man, it's dark and I don't know how to get back. I was like, far be it for me to be a dumbass and get lost in Skywalker Ranch to get bit by a honey badger or some shit. So, <laughs> Chupacabra. Next, I was like, Jesus. So the next day, drive to ILM. And this was before ILM was at the Presidio, right? It was when ILM was still in this, like, it looked like uh, an old, uh, like, strip mall had closed down, right? It was like some real James Bond shit, which was like fake restaurants that didn't exist and like not McDonald's, but it was just like McDougal's and shit. So I didn't know it was ILM. I was just driving around going, what is this place, right? And then Rob Coleman sees me driving around. Rob Coleman was the head of animation at the time. He runs um, uh, Australia. He runs, they do the Lego movies now down in Australia. I remember in a second. Um, but Rob Coleman jumps out and he goes, it's here, right? I pull in, I meet Rob, and then I walk into ILM. And it's just like the same experience with the ranch. I walk into ILM and the first two things I see are the Energizer Bunny from the fucking still going commercials and the original Han Solo Frozen in Carbonite. And I'm like, try not to freak out, right? I'm like, what's happening in here? So I go into the volume, which was this big warehouse where they had all these infrared cameras and, and um, they put me in a room and they go, put this very revealing cat suit on that has ping pong balls all over it and shit. And I was like, 
okay. Um, and then they and they gave me like six inch platform shoes. Like, Jar Jar is supposed to be taller than me, right? So they're like, here are these shoes, here are this very revealing costume, put that on and come out when you're ready, right? And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Like, I feel like I'm being punked, right? So I'm putting all this stuff on, I put the headband on and ping pong balls everywhere. And I walk out and I was like, all right, let's, you know, only got so much time before y'all about to see everything. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, let's get this going. And they're just like, oh, we just have to wait for George. And I was like, George who? <laughs> George Lucas, right? And I was like, this is the first time I'm gonna meet George Lucas and I'm wearing this? Like, what is, why am I? So I get immediately, I'm like shook. I'm like, oh no, what am I doing? Like, and so I, I pull somebody over and I'm like, okay, can somebody give me like something? Like, wh who, who am I? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? Like, they are like, can't tell you, can't give you a script. Can't tell you what you look like. Can't tell you anything. George is going to direct you once he gets here. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> George comes in, right? And he's just like, hey, hey, you know, all quiet and shit. Got the, you know, flannel, <laughs> beard, you know what I'm saying? Wearing some, some, you know, trainers. He's like, okay, hey, how you doing? I'm like, hey, Mr. Lucas, how are you? And he's like, yeah, it's good to see you. Uh, okay, so can you just walk back and forth? And I was like, all right. <sighs> Start walking back and forth. And he's like, all right, you know, can you get really low to the ground? And I did the same shit I did with Robin, right? And he's like, no, no, can you stand up? Now, can you do it like a little more loping, like with your arms swinging? Like, can you go like a little bit slower and like really loose, like really loose and gangly? I was like, all right, bet. I did all of that, you know? And that eventually became like the Jar Jar walk. Right? And then he goes, okay, do whatever you want. Right? I was like, okay. <laughs> so I did the same shit I did in Robin's office, right? Which, you know, wearing six inch platforms was hard, but I was like, if I can pull this shit off, I probably have a really dope career as a drag queen after this. <laughs> so I was doing like backflips and like kicks and spins and jumps and all of this shit. And I was like, cause I didn't know like, how much to do and how much not to do, right? So I'm doing all of this stuff. And George is just like, okay, thanks. <laughs> and leaves, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I think I messed this up. I might've just done too much, right? So I go out to dinner, get back on tour, right? A month goes by, I hadn't hear, heard anything. I was like, well, you know, that was fun. I got to meet George and this weird thing happened at ILM that, you know, if that video is on the black market, it's some really dope blackmail, it'll probably be all right, right? I'm in Philly and doing Stomp and I get a call. And I'm like, would you like to be in Star Wars? I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then I started freaking out. I was like, ah. And they were just like, you can't tell anybody. You can't tell anybody what you're doing. You can't tell anybody where you're going. And you can't tell anybody what's going to be happening. And, and this was, was like, 1997 okay. still, right? 97. Yeah, yeah, this was 97. Wow. And they were like, and I was just like, well, I got to go do a movie. And I can't tell you what it is, but it's going to be in an undisclosed location somewhere in the world. And it's gonna be great maybe yeah and so the next thing i know i'm on a virgin atlantic flight to leaves in in london and i'm in the star wars movie it's oh pretty crazy God. that's incredible oh so joining that's us not maybe, even the craziest <laughs> dude i i, I can i want to hear like once it gets started and you're working with everybody in 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 the desert and there's I, i'm sure there's so much of your um you know your it sounds like you're musically athletic too that was brought to that character because he's got such a rhythm to him and like you're just talking about how he walked and how George and you were discovering that that's just fascinating um because you know it yeah, is that was a big totally, deal it's totally strange terrain it's it, like what he was doing with with your character and also like Watto and Sebulba um yeah. these movies get they're synonymous with visual effects and digital effects and while those characters were 
like at the forefront of it, breaking new ground, there's more model work in Phantom Menace than any other movie in history by, by double. And I think um, yes. it's also how they pr presented the movie. They say this movie's going to be, you know, see breathtaking new technology. And everyone sold, was, was sold on that. And then you look at, you know, sequel trilogy and they're like, we're going back to practical effects. And they show you four. Yeah. The whole movie is, looks like a cutscene. Yeah. Yeah. Video. Yeah. It's just about how you sell things. But I thought uh, episode one is always the most special for me because it was this amalgamation of the future and on all the past techniques. And, you know, Jar Jar was like the ultimate epitome of, of the future. And look at cinema now. Like, uh, look what they're doing with like the Mandalorian. Look what they're doing. Star Wars is finally breaking new ground again, uh, which I think is exciting in terms of storytelling, visual storytelling and visual effects. And uh, also we got Sam now, in case you guys uh, are, are looking down in his little box down there. Say hi, Sam. I saw this Phantom Menace. I saw it. Sam plays like basically every cool bad guy in Star Wars. Sam, how did you order this, <laughs> this game? Year. Yes, my young apprentice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, I just loved how Phantom Menace was weird because it reminded you that the first time you saw Star Wars, when R2-D2 falls over and all the Jawas come out, that's weird, man. What's going on? I don't understand. And Phantom Menace, I, I remember seeing all the rocket ships and all the designs mm. and stuff like that and going like, why does this feel right? Oh, right, because... George is making a statement that the prehistory of Star Wars is Flash Gordon, uh, 1930s, yeah. just a crab, you know, like, and, uh, and there is something Flash very Gordon. old school about the way it was shot, the way the performances were, and all this, everything was weird, and Jar Jar was weird, and everything was weird, and I remember just watching the movie going, this is not <laughs> what I saw in my head, it's so weird, and that's what kept me watching it over and over and over again because i was like what is going on this is so weird cool and that's what i i've going forward into clone wars and all that stuff my favorite stuff that we've ever done is the weird stuff it's it's yeah. when george and everyone was we were all trying something that had never been done in star wars and what that does is it pushes out the bounds of what is possible in star wars so those risks when people do things that maybe don't seem um like ideas that everyone would understand right away that's when it's the most exciting yeah i think george uh for me george doesn't george doesn't fuck around like he he had a vision with these movies and you're, he's breaking new ground in terms of you know the technical technological stuff but but he's getting into virgin births and chosen ones and he's trying out new things he's flexing the the mythic muscles you know he's going into deeper into fantasy deeper into flash gordon deeper into soap opera deeper into screwball and this is just this mind, this guy's mind like unhinged. It's just doing whatever he wants and he has his own money, his checks to write, he does it. He has no studio executives telling him. So I, I look at uh, Phantom Menace as one of the most pure things out of his head. He went back to mm. his draft in 1974, his original mm. script, Adventures of Starkiller. And he's pulling all these ideas of Aquile and turning into Naboo and, and everyone's like, oh, this movie's weird. And they're like, but hold on, this movie is actually from his nascent Star Wars ideas. He's extracting yeah. all the beautiful stuff and then he's extrapolating on it with this technology he has and, and this vision he afforded himself. And he didn't tell it this way because back in 1976 when he's on set, he didn't have the resources to tell a story so grand. So Jen, what yeah. when you 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 probably fell in love with Star Wars as a young girl, like like uh, all of us as kids and and you're writing Star Wars. It's gotta be a, an incredible feeling. What was your been a menace or your prequel? Uh, memories and what do you what do you got to say about these? Well, I think Phantom Menace was the strongest for me because I um, I had just moved to LA in '97, and Phantom Menace came out. What was it? '99 was it? '99. '99. '99. Yeah, and I remember seeing it at my you you know where you, the theater near UCLA. I forget what theater that was, and it had the box with yeah. the marquee. It was the one with blue curtains yeah, and that's the fox the, okay yeah, i saw it there a bunch of times and when i walked out i realized dennis muren was sitting behind me the whole time <laughs> and i went to usc <laughs> jen can i ask a question yeah. can i ask a question really quick when dennis muren was behind you did did he did he do something like this <laughs> dun, 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 dun. did he do that I did not know until we had walked out and then people were surrounding him. I was like, oh, wow, that just happened. No, yeah, no, it was not that grand. But um, I, I went to USC because of George and because of Spielberg and because of John Williams. So 
I have such precious memories of that because also we had nothing at the time. All we had were the you know the original trilogy, and this was all new. And I, you know, as a fan, like fandom is very different now. Where like we didn't have ten million things to complain about. We we were just everything was so precious. I mean, it was to me anyway. And I was just happy to see this new thing. And I had I had seen it at least God seven times. And I was. I was still visiting Long Island where I'm from in New York and I went back and saw it in the theater there. And I was like, wow, this looks super crappy. California and Los Angeles are really into their cinema. And I could tell just like physically by the screen. So I'm just, it's just visual. I was so learning film at the time and then seeing that and then having heroes around me that had done this and then now doing what I do now. It's, I, I have a very soft spot for Phantom Menace specifically. Yeah, I think you know what there's some sequences in this movie that are astounding. Like no matter what you you want to say, like a lot of people identify with a generation of Star Wars movies. Like there's people that are firmly entrenched in original trilogy. I know people that are uh, you know just will go to death over the prequels and and sequel trilogy now has its uh, people that they identify most with that one. And there's the Clone Wars generation. It's people that filled that gap and they fell in love with that. And I think it's um it's fascinating especially if you go to Celebration you see these periods. But um what was going on, I think, then was there's a little bit of a, a schism, you know, in Star Wars and in fandom. There's people that definitely wanted the movies to have grown up with them. They wanted the movies to have matured, the point of view in the movies to have changed yeah. to suit them as a 30 year old. And George was saying, you know what, this is, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to tell it a very specific way that I have in my head. And I think there was people rubbed up against that because people identified so deeply with Star Wars, they felt it was theirs. You know, they, they owned yeah. it. We were supposed to take Star Wars home with us as kids. We, we had gaps years, three years between movies and we'd have to play with the toys and we'd imagine these stories in our head. So the stories that we always thought they would be, like Sam was saying, they're, they were not, we're like, wait, what did you just do? Like, this is different. <laughs> <laughs> like, I saw it seven times in 28 hours. When it, when it <laughs> Seriously? Okay. You, were, you, you beat my record. Damn. I was bringing Amazing. everyone with me. I was like, come on, fuckers, let's go. We'd get KFC, we'd go back to the 4 a.m. show. We would just kept going. That's and I loved it. And I and there was I had friends that were like, I don't know, like I'm into the Matrix. I'm like, no, no, this is this is Star Wars, and I still think this is, it's the the prequels are so intrinsically Star Wars because they're so purely mm -hmm. George. It's George with all the resources yeah. at his disposal to tell what's in his heart and his head, and that's why I think you know they have the the magic to endure. That's why I think they're getting so much more love right now, um, because sequel trilogy may or may not have connected with people. You know, I, I like two out of three of them, I'll be honest. And uh, I, I think they they're, they're weren't as bold, uh, mythically. They weren't as bold um, visual effects. I don't think, and you're not really breaking new ground, like say the prequels were, the original trilogy yeah. were. So um, it's nice to see people going back to the prequels to appreciate those giant steps George was taking, those giant swings he was taking. Um, Claire, and you've gotten to, you know, spend a lot of time around the Star Wars franchise, and obviously this was a, we've talked prequels before, we've done panels before, Claire and I, mm -hmm. where we talk about, um, you know, the prequel appreciation society and how much we love the, the prequels. I almost felt bad doing it, because I was like, listen, assholes, these movies are here. I don't need to have to apologize for shit. I like these movies, so shut up. You know, I've seen this a hundred times. But uh, Claire, I know you're a big fan of these movies, so do you have any yeah. uh, thoughts? Um, I was in college when they came out or when, when they started coming out, but my siblings were in elementary school and Star Wars was something that we always had together because as, as soon as like they were old enough to watch them, I was showing it to them and um, just like I, the sibling that I have that's my age could care less. So when I had a new crop of siblings I molded them into everything I wanted them to be. <laughs> and um, I got permission for, um, cause right before the, right before um, episode one came out, they re-released the original trilogy in the theaters. Yeah, yeah, Do you guys remember that? Yeah. And then you could go watch mm -hmm. them all on the same day. And I took them all to go do that. And so by the time episode one came out and it was coming out at midnight, um, it was the first midnight movie that I got to take all of my siblings to, and they all got to um, check in late for school the next day. And um, we continued to do that through the next couple of movies. But um, uh, I think I also saw that movie, the first one, seven times in the theater. It was like a good summer for movies and just a really good time to be a Star Wars fan. 
Yeah. 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 I think it, you know, the some of the stuff that I always feel with the prequels, um, it's people's expectations rubbing against the reality of of what George, the story he had to tell. And I say he had to tell because mm. you can't go re create what happened before. There's no need for Han Solo in the prequels. Han Solo is a byproduct of imperial oppression. Um, so everyone's like, well, there's no character like that. Well, Han Solo needed to vacillate in, in, in this weird space. He needed to operate you know, off the grid. And there's a reason because, because you needed to feel the effects of what the empire did. And things were a little more clearly yeah. drawn in that because they were rebelling against something that was so uh, oppressive and stratified. And then you go back to this era and the ships are very they're beautiful. They're not, they're not necessarily functional. They're just, you have chrome and yellow and they're just ornate because they hadn't seen combat in a thousand years. So there's these decisions he made that he got maligned for, but actually if you, if you strip it back, there's so much deep thought that went into it that he's, he's imbuing this world with, with history and, and layers. And, and a lot of people are just like, well, I want it to be the same, but a little different, just a little different, you know, and we kind of got the same, but a little different with, with the, um, with some of the sequels movies and I, and I, and I like them. But um, George is not a guy to, to fuck around with the, with the same. You know, I mean, you guys have probably seen this working in Clone Wars. Like he's t- he took a lot of bold swings and tried tried to play with different genres and tried to play with different uh, formats. And I think um, he's not one to rest on his laurels. So no, I always no, the- he's a risk taker. You know, George is a risk taker. You know, and you know the dude was going to be a race car driver. And then he got into a really bad accident and then pivoted. But that ethic of, you know, pedal to the metal, drive straight forward is consistent in how he is as a filmmaker as well. You know, I remember having a conversation with him one time when Phantom Menace came out and, you know, he, he, he and I would talk a lot, like, you know, one of the reasons why I, I, I teach film at USC now is, is because of George. Like George was like my film school. And every time I had the opportunity to drive to the set with him, I took it. And then all my days off, I would be on set. And I'd just be sitting behind him, watching him do his thing just quietly. And then whenever I had an opportunity, you know, I would just try to pick his brain and ask him questions and, you know, try to figure out why he made the choices that he made. You know, we developed a really, a really good relationship, you know, a really strong relationship as far as like being able to share information as, as artists. And, you know, I asked him about Phantom Menace when it came out, and people not really understanding his direction. And he was like, it's, he really drew the parallel between going from fresco paintings to oil paintings. You know, when people started painting in oils, all the traditional painters who were just like all about fresco said that they were full of shit. And oil paintings didn't get anywhere. Nobody wanted to buy them. Nobody wanted to, nobody was interested in hanging them. They weren't looked at as fine art. It was this new technique with this new material that um, people who were used to seeing the thing had a hard time with. Yeah. Then the Menace is the same thing. Every film technique from the beginning of film till now is in the Phantom Menace, if you think about it. Every single one. And we're talking 20 years later right and they have not in film history have not done anything that phantom menace had did right every film technique is in there in that one movie every single one to be that forward thinking to have that kind of vision to have that kind of courage to say no i'm doing this and everyone is just going to have to catch up yeah is a one it comes from like a once in a lifetime person you know what I'm saying? And yeah. I think as far as credit goes for Phantom Menace and, you know, the other two prequels, you know, Clones was the first movie ever shot on digital, yeah. ever. Insane. Right. So, you know, for for the Phantom Menace, as far as like a piece of art, that there in movies, there was before the Phantom Menace and after. That one is the anchor. Like that one is right is where everything changed right and george's is just 
this intrepid visionary who made it happen. And, you know, he doesn't mind taking a hit. Yeah. Doesn't get enough credit. I don't he, think he gets enough credit. Sam, you got to work, um, got to know George. And did you ever get the opportunity to pick his brain about um, <laughs> Corey Life? The things that aren't on screen, because there is so much that's that's in these movies that Clone Wars filled the gaps on. But for a while, they weren't like the Sifo Dias stuff and all these yeah. different subplots. Did you get a, like a, uh, an intimate chance to, to pick his <laughs> Brain. I've talked to him a few times and it's and it's pretty amazing. It's but, it's uh, pretty fun. Yeah. I don't the first conversation I ever had with George was uh at the um release of the Force Unleashed. Um, which for for the record, I, I believe George's take on Force Unleashed was that we didn't take enough risks. Um, which I totally respect. You know, when when that guy says that, you're like, I guess we didn't take enough risks. You know what I mean? Like, um, thematically, uh, I know that he liked I think he I think he liked the force risks, but but he wanted to make it clear that, that that was for the video game. That was a video game world. But one of the things that, that um, we talked about was, you know, like one of the first scenes we ever tried to, to do in, um, <laughs> in The Force Unleashed <laughs> was, was we were trying to do a scene and it, it just doesn't, it wasn't working. It didn't feel like Star Wars because we were going like, you know, uh, how many pilots have you lost before me? Seven. Well, what's going on here? He wants to be found. Well, then we're walking into a trap. And we just did it a few times. It just wasn't working. We were all getting kind of bummed out. And then I and then I was like, wait, wait, guys, guys, can I just try something? Can I try something? And I said to the crew and the actors, I'm like, uh, faster, more intense, maybe? Oh. And then we were all like, what do you think's going on? Well, I was at Order 66 when the squads were done. Wow, well, do you think we're walking into a trap? How many how pilots have you lost? Seven. All right, let's go. You know, it was like suddenly we were in the 1940s in George's world, and and uh, we were talking about that, and he laughed. He go and he said, "Well, yeah, that is kind of where it comes from, and that you know the whole Buster Crab and the fast talking type of stuff." But George, um, the the thing that that I loved the most was just the the directives that he gave us. The, the, hey, guess what? We're gonna bring Darth Maul back, and he's a spider guy with a spider butt, Kyle, with a spider butt. <laughs> I love Darth Maul, but the spider butt there, I never loved Well, but, but you know, and then imagine like, like- There's George came up with that, okay. Right, and, and he's just like, well, I'm so, I know it's crazy. I get it, he died. I know it's crazy, but we're gonna make a point. We're gonna make some interesting points about the force and the dark side and stuff like that. So deal with it, make yeah. it work. And you're just like, okay, uh, I'm the actor that has to do it. People are gonna hate me. And Dave's like, yeah, what do you, how do you think I, my life is like? You know, and, and, and that was the Probably. whole thing is George kept putting himself and everyone else, he expected everyone to step up to the firing line and give their all. Um, even if it, the idea, we were like, I don't know if this is going to work. He's like, yeah, but that's that's the point. If you, you don't know how an idea is going to work until you do it. If you know how a, an idea is going to work, it's because maybe you've seen it somewhere before and you're riffing on someone else or you're copying someone else. If you don't know how an idea is going to work, maybe you're onto something completely new. And, I, and that's what I absolutely adored about working on the Clone Wars under George is that he threw us some things like the Mortis trilogy, you know, uh, hi, Sam, you're going to be playing the dark side of the force. Like, what, is, what, what does that sound like? What the, I don't want to do that. Okay, I'll do it. You know, but it was, that was the, that was the, <laughs> the pleasure of working for, for George Lucas and, uh, and him getting to just blue sky, all of his crazy star Wars ideas and just blow it out. It was, Fun. Good day, yeah. the impression, by the way. What's that? Oh, Great sure. Baloney impression, by yeah, the way. Yeah, spot on. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, George told me. Uh, don't tell me what uh, I told you. You're fired. Ah, uh, it's a uh, lot of time, George. <laughs> yeah, we've talked before about this. The the you know, the framing in these movies and how George really he tried to mirror a lot of things. Uh, obviously, sequel trilogy, yeah. some new filming techniques, and they started getting into flashbacks and things. But George stayed very true to it. And Sam, we've had conversations about like composition and stuff. And um, I think that's that's what's commendable about him is he he really like the world had changed, but he was going to let Star Wars be consistent and pure. And Jen, when you were working on, say, Force of Destiny, obviously you got to work with Dave, and Dave's a a disciple of the great GL. Did you um, what kind of pearls of wisdom did you get from that? And you obviously got to play with the prequel era in your yes. in your series. Yeah, I mean the pearls of wisdom, I guess, would come from come from Dave. I mean we we, we knew each other back. Uh, during the Avatar Last Airbender days. And I, I guess honestly one of the one of the biggest things would be don't assume things. I don't know. There, it was, there was kind of a feeling of 
like put your fandom aside almost a little bit sometimes. And I, I, he, the, I mean, he connects things in such an amazing way. I don't, you know, I, I don't know if you've been in a room like breaking story or stuff with him before, but it's really, really interesting. Uh, and very zen about it. He's very, very zen about things in, in a lot of ways. For an Italian, he's very calm. He's one of the calmest <laughs> Italians I've ever met. So that's that was very jarring uh, for me personally. But uh, uh, yeah, that the, the pearls of wisdom was don't necessarily go read canon. Don't you know? Don't look at Reddit's. You know, don't assume things. You know, we can do things that you might not think we can do. And I think that was really yeah. cool. That's good. Ahmed, did you guys talk about your character? Obviously, you know, you talked a little bit about how when you first, you did have no direction when you first got Jar Jar and you just had to just perform and show who you were as a person and what you could do. Did you, as the relationship developed with George, did you get a, a, an inkling as to where this character was going on set? Did he pull you aside and give you some Jar Jar history or where he ended up in, in your mind beyond the movies? Because there's a book that they wrote where Jar Jar ends up as like a, He's like a, a juggling panhandler on the, in the streets yeah. of the city. And I was so offended by that book. But I, I wonder if you had like a, a vision for where your character was going, if George and you got, you talked. Yeah, I mean, you know, I truly had a very unique experience more so than I think anyone because um, mocap had never been done before. And it, it was one of those like, new groundbreaking things that George was extremely excited about. So I spent a lot of time with him, um, even after principal photography, like I worked on Phantom Menace for two years. So it was, you know, back and forth between New York and ILM almost every week. And um, he was incredibly just generous with letting me play and letting me, you know, experiment and figure something out. And, you know, it's funny because a lot of the, a lot, a lot of actors who work with George are just like, oh, you know, he doesn't really talk to you and he's not really an actor's director and all this stuff. I don't have that experience with George. He was incredibly um, loquacious with me and he was extremely involved in the acting when it came with me because I think he was just excited he was excited about the tech and the ability to get this done, but he didn't know how much an, a person could do, right? He thought that it was going to be mostly animation. So um, when I would come in with something physical, he'd be like, can you do that? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. And then I'd do it and he'd be like, great. Now then and all the animators had to do was like copy. And, you know, I didn't really had, I didn't know, it was actually Liam Neeson who brought this shit out because, all right, so we're doing this scene, the scene where I first meet Liam and we're walking through the forest and I'm just like, no, Mr. Jar Jar Binks, you know? Uh, oh no, it's demanded by the gods it is. And then the, the, the droids fire back and I'm like, oh no, right? So the way it's written in the script is, you know, I go through the thing, Mr. Jar Jar Binks, Mr. Your Humble Seven, that won't be necessary. Uh, you know, that, all that thing. He disses me, the ability to speak doesn't make one intelligent, now get out of here. I was like, Dad, it's a diss, bro. Right? <laughs> so the droids fire, and in the script, I'm just supposed to like, like fall with the ground, right? So we're doing this a couple of times. I'm just like, hmm, I don't know, it's, it's fall. And Liam looks at me and he goes, what, what's going on? And I was like, yeah, I just think that this could be, you know, a little bit more exciting. He was like, well, what do you think you should do? And I was like, I think I could just like jump straight up in the air and just like dive into the ground. I think it'd be real funny just to see like the last thing in the frame, like my feet, like flying into the ground, right? And he goes, let's go. And he takes me over to George, right? And I'm like, oh shit, Liam's gonna fight for me, right? I'm like, oh man, the Liam Neeson. He's gonna go over there, he's gonna tell George this idea and I'll get to do it, right? So Liam goes, come, go over to George. And he goes, George, Ahmed has a suggestion. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> and I was like, well, um, I'm on the spot now, so I gotta say it. And I was like, yeah, the oh no, I think I, 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 
maybe can I try to take a where I just like jump out of frame and then just like dive back in frame? And he goes, can you do that? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so we go back, do the thing. Liam hits the disc, right? And I'm just like, oh, it's the man by the gods it is, right? Look out, bang, bang, bang. Jump straight up, out of frame, come straight down, boom. Cut. Everybody starts laughing. George is like, that's great. And that's what ends up in the movie, right? And I was like, you know, after the take, I was like, hey, man, thanks, Liam. And he goes, don't ever, ever hold your ideas to yourself. If you have an idea, say it. The worst the director can say is no. And I was like, got it. Mm -hmm. And then from then on, I had all of these just ideas that I, I thought would just enhance the character, enhance the role. And George loved it. Like it was something that, it was a thing that he didn't have to think about, right? One of the days on set, he had like nine things happening and we had this huge rainstorm in the desert, right? And, you know, it's it, the desert was bananas. I actually really loved the desert in Tunisia. It was wonderful. I felt at home there for some reason, it was great. But we were there on the hottest two weeks um, of the year and they called it the devil's fortnight, right? So as we're walking through the devil's fortnight and it's like super hot, it's like 150 degrees, the night before we start to shoot, thunder, right? And then torrential rains in the desert. And the people in the hotel were just like, wow, this is crazy. It hasn't rained here in 40 years, right? <laughs> They're like, what? This week, it chooses to rain after, you know, damn near two scores, right? <laughs> so everything is all fucked up. We go to set, everything is drenched. No, no set, one set survived, right? And George was like, well, that's what we're shooting. And then we moved the schedule around. Everybody gets crazy. He's just like cleaning up, right? And George is like having a day. And I'm like, hey, man, you OK? And he goes, you know, Ahmed, the hardest part of directing is dealing with the day-to-day -day problems. He said, I already know what the movie is. I've, I've done that. I got that. I know exactly what it's going to look like. I have it all. Like, I already know, know what the movie is. Directing is the day-to-day -day problems. It's like, it hasn't rained here in 40 years. You got to deal with that today. <laughs> you know? Wow. Like, this is the part of directing. And so with me, I was just like, whatever I can take off that plate, just so you can have as many choices as possible, I'm going to do. You know what I mean? And I personally... I'm that type of an artist anyway. I'm very much a, a, a giver. Like I like to, I like the collaboration part of it. And you know, Jar Jar, I always say it was three departments. It was me, it was George, and it was Aya Lab. The three of us make Jar Jar. And the three of the three departments just had this wonderful just rapport with all of all, all, with each other. And you know, Jar Jar's Buster Keaton. <laughs> so we all love Buster Keaton movies. And so, you know, George would be like, hey, there's this part in this Buster Keaton movie. Do you think you can do that? And I was like, yeah. Look at Rob Coleman and John Noel and be like, hey, do you guys think we can do this? And they were just like, I don't know. Just do it and we'll figure it out. And that was the process. And it was just so exciting, exciting to be in that world, exciting to be in that process. And it was great to just work the muscle like that. You know what I'm saying? Like idea to actual execution. That's great. Yeah, the, the the physical the physical comedy you're talking about is something I mean, it was a big part of like George's film history. So it's great. He reflects everything that he's absorbed back in such a unique way. I mean, it's imbued with like screwball comedies, physical comedy, samurai films, you know, uh, yeah. like the Flash Gordon uh, serials and and the the space operas. It's like he absorbs it all and he finds a way to like put it back out there for us to experience it in a new way. And he imbues it with this spiritual message. And I think that's, that's the ultimate, the big unifying thing. And it's just a purity to, to Jar Jar and it's a purity to the way George tells stories, which is, it's rare now. Everything's so cynical and everything's so, um, and I feel like it's safe, you know? And uh, there's something about the- Yeah, I, it's kind of hard, man. I mean, it's a, it's a tough, it's tough. These new Star Wars movies, it's tough to be these new Star Wars movies. It's, yeah. It really is because 
with the the OG um, trilogy and with the prequels, all we had to do was make George happy. That was it. Like everybody was working, and he was right there. You know what I'm saying? Like whenever there was a problem, be like George. Like everybody had the same thing. You know, everybody be like, I don't know. Do you think? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. And then be like, okay, George. And he'd be like, I don't know. Try it. And then we try it. And then it would either work or not work. Now you have so many layers of people and so many people who are just who who are trying to interpret um, what George has created. And then you have to go through. Well, it's not like this. And not you have just these enormous committees of human beings that are trying to stay true to um, uh, an idea that one person had control over. Yeah. For that was the 40 years. Yeah, you know that what I'm was, saying? So it's that, it's so very difficult to be these new movies. Yeah, it was the, that was the um that's what I keep saying about the independent nature of George Lucas because he was an indie filmmaker. I mean, you watch Phantom Menace and you forget that's an indie film. <laughs> he, he funded the damn thing. Yeah. He made it himself with his own companies. Um it's it's you know, it's it's like Kevin Smith making Clerks or something except on a giant scale and we have never seen an indie filmmaker build a film on that scale and i remember dave filoni telling me that 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 you know yeah it's it's the difficulty of making star wars now is that you know you you don't have you know some cra crazy george lucas billionaire guy going well we're going to do this crazy thing and he he one of the things that we loved doing was that yes george would come out with a crazy idea and then it would as you said just be a straight line toward that idea there was no mm -hmm committee of people that had to discuss well is that a good idea how's that going to go let's run that through a focus group which by the way are, these are things that people do because of the tremendous costs to make these things so these aren't mm -hmm. like dumb things that people do to get in the way these are things that people do so that yeah. they know we're not making a mistake right we, we want to do a good job here but george lucas would just be like do do that and you're like okay uh, everyone gather around we're all going in this direction and that was the end of it and that was the the beauty of of his independent Lucasfilm, which is why I always say, I think for history's sake, we need to put a little bit of a, a line around the George Lucas produced Star Wars, just to uh, acknowledge the fact that we have never seen an independent filmmaker do something like this. And we've never seen an independent filmmaker take all the money that he made from this and then reinvest it right back into the company because he wanted to make more things and he wanted to create talent. Yeah. He had a vision for the technology too. I mean, you're talking about like online editing and um, I mean, they were doing like the digital editing was something that just people weren't doing and the yeah. visual effects and, and re literally taking all of his, his earnings and, and reinvesting it into a vision of how filmmaking should be, how yeah. he could be a problem yeah. for other filmmakers in the future and taking those risks upon himself. Like yes. you're talking about being the first digital film, the reshoots for Phantom Menace, he started integrating digital cameras and testing it. You can kind of see which films pop a little bit, but he's like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to learn. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to immerse myself in this process and learn. He was testing doing Young Indiana Jones Chronicles and, mm -hmm. and gearing up with the special edition in order to prep himself for this. So he could flex these muscles and be ready to tell those stories. Yeah. So it's just, it's fascinating to me. I, I, again, it's, 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 you know, and I, I include some work that I did for Lucasfilm that wasn't directly under George as being outside of the George circle, you know, the, the, because I think that needs to be a special thing that we all remember that this was one guy's vision, uh, the, the Star Wars, the first six Star Wars movies and the Clone Wars TV show were his thing. Now, here we are trying to set off, you know, like a, like a bird's being pushed out of a nest, trying to set off and make this stuff um, again and trying to get it right. Um, but but we do need to acknowledge that there is a nucleus and that needs to be kind of, you know, and that's George's thing and that needs to be kind of sacred, that, that that is its own thing. And going forward, yeah. now other people get, a, you know, a turn at bat, you know, and other people get a chance to do these things. And, uh, you know, and that's that's the only way these things continue, that people have to have their chance to contribute, their chance to put what they feel is personal into Star Wars, because George already did it. George did it, yeah. you know, we have it. But if they know? do it in that spirit where, it's mm -hmm. trying an idea, like trying something and not having to worry about if it's going to work, but being bold right. to do that. And I think we're seeing that in some of the new stuff. Like I, I bet there was a boldness to Mandalorian. Um, and I love the new Clone Wars. 
if you haven't seen it, you know, watch that arc right now. Sam, you're killing it, Matt. That yeah. episode just dropped so today. Good. Um, so let's go back, Claire. What, are, what like, do you have like a, a favorite prequel memory or experience? It doesn't even have to be a scene from the movie, but something that's just so synonymous with the prequel, the prequel era of uh, Star Wars fandom. Um, I think it was. I mean, I think it was just like the community behind it all, um, and just having like something that I felt like was sort of obscure, you know, for a, a long time, just reemerge and, and have everyone at the same time really into it. And it sort of felt like a, like a validation almost of um, <laughs> yeah. loving it for so long. Um, I don't know. I, I think the, the episode one is probably the, the most fun memories just because it was just so exciting to have Star Wars back. Yeah. Yep. What about you, Jen? I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, it's it was having it back. It, I, I, I just, I was just so appreciative of it. Also, I mean, it's funny, the second movie, the memories of Dave Filoni and Giancarlo Volpe dressing up at this <laughs> uh, opening night. <laughs> Do you remember that? You know what I'm talking about, right? I think most fans know about that. Well, tell the story anyway, because I wasn't there. I want to know what happened. And well, yeah, I, I think a lot of Nickelodeon, a couple of Nickelodeon people went, and I just remember them being interviewed, and I forget who was what. I, I forgot what they dressed up as, but they were in like full green and blue makeup. I mean, they had the whole head pieces and everything. And I think that was about the time when George called Dave to start doing this stuff. I think it was around the second movie. What year was, wow. was that? I think it would have been after Sith. Was it after Sith? I think so, yes. It was around that time. It was like, oh, four or five, maybe? Around that time. And so, the, I mean, I, I, that time period was really exciting and new and I had just gotten here and I started being in the business in 02. And and being and seeing Dave go through that process was really fun. I mean, I wasn't like at every moment, but like you know, we were all in the same friend groups, and it was just really nice for his dreams to come true like that. Mm -hmm. So th that's a fond memory. I mean, Phantom Menace was one thing when I first got there and being at USC, and then the second one was seeing my friend's dreams come true, and and he helped bring me along the way, which was really nice of him. A decade later, a decade later, which is really cool. So it's all connected for me. You know. What about you, Ahmed? You know, um, Phantom Menace was, is, is special to me because for a lot of reasons, you know, because of lifelong friendships um, that I've made with, with everybody involved. Um, it was my very first feature film, you know. Before that, I was just doing theater in New York. And... Um, I was so green and and new and terrified, um, but I was so fucking excited that I didn't care about all those other things. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't want to get fired, which was a big deal. <laughs> but um, the fact that um, it was Star Wars was just one of the things that was exciting. What was really special was this new ground and being able to be a part of this historical moment in filmmaking, you know, and to be a part of um, the team that made that happen, you know. I didn't really get it at the time. You know, at the time, I was just like, I'm having the time of my life. This is fun. I get to, you know, hang around some great people and I get to learn some stuff. But the, the gravity of, of doing The Phantom Menace has built over time. And, and me recognizing and realizing how important that is in the history of filmmaking has been really special. And I think the other thing is, um, you know, there's, there's a... There's a scene that in, in Phantom Menace where um, 
we took a long time to do because we kept laughing. Um, it was like the submarine scene with me and you and, and Liam and like Liam's in the back. And we're going, you know, right before we get to the surface, right out of Auto Gunga. And, you know, the big, there's always a bigger fish moment. Um, shooting that was ridiculous. <laughs> um, because it was just the three of us sitting in this thing. And, you know, Liam's a big dude and I'm not small, right? And, and you know, we're sitting in this half a submarine and the, the thing that's making us move are like, two burly British grips, just like moving this up and down, <laughs> right? They're just like, uh, and then like in between takes, they're like, you're all right, mate. Yeah, you're all right, you're all right, man, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in this submarine being shaken by these two dudes and I have this line that goes, but you boom the gasser, then crash into boss's hay blipper, then vanish, right? And I had no idea what this was supposed to mean. And Every time I said it, I said it differently because I didn't know it was, I, I didn't know I don't know how to say it, right? And so we're blowing takes and Liam's mustache is flying off because he's laughing and like just you know, and somebody did the math on set and told us that um the movie was costing twenty thousand dollars a minute, right? So Every take that we're blowing, all I'm thinking is, oh shit, twenty thousand dollars a minute. Like, you know, we're just blowing twenty thousand dollars a minute. So I'm just like, all right, I gotta get, we're fucking this up. I gotta go get this right. So I go over to George and I'm just like, hey man, the boom the gasser line, like, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> right? And he goes, I don't know. I'm like, you don't know. <laughs> You wrote it. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. And he goes, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Just do what you're doing. It's fine. Just go, just do it. And I learned a really, really important thing. <laughs> it's good not to know. And it's really good to say, I don't know. Yeah. Because when you're there and you're figuring it out, and you're working with all these people, you find out. And that discovery is exciting. And being around those people and figuring it out is exciting. And I think the wonderful thing about George Lucas as the leader was he was able to say, I don't know. And saying, I don't know, let us find it. Let us figure it out. Let us come together and go, okay, let's try it this way. Let's move this way. Let's say it this way. And let's have fucking fun doing it, right? And that was incredibly valuable to me. Moving forward as an artist, if I don't know something, I'll say it. I, I don't know. Because that's when the magic is going to happen. Knowing everything isn't fun. Not knowing is a fucking blast. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? <laughs> yeah. What does the line mean? <laughs> I mean, if you figured it out, what is it? Yeah. What, you don't know? It is I mean, I had, I kind of had an idea of it, right? Because it's you like, remember? how were you banished? Yeah. I mean, the, the line is, um, you know, you were banished for being clumsy, right? I'm saying, yeah, you might say, boom, the gasser and crashing the boss's hay blipper, and then I was banished. Boss Nass had a, a, a ship called the hay blipper, right? And I was driving the hay blipper. <laughs> I pressed on the gas. It crashed. <laughs> Boss Nass got pissed and banished me from auto gun gun. Right. That's was where there, I was coming from. Now, was there something called a gasser that you also boomed? Like, ah, oh, boomed the gasser, and I did. What, what was the boom the gasser thing? Boom the gasser is like I I stepped on the gas and it went too fast. Oh, boom the gasser. Right? Okay, like, yeah, yeah, you stepped in the pedal to the metal, crashed the boss's hay blipper. He hated it, and he was just like, "Get out." That's amazing. I. Because I have, you know, having seen that movie as many times as I have, the line read is in my head, indelibly burned in here. And now there is a yeah. whole, you have given me a whole layer of meaning. I'm seeing young Jar Jar destroy and, and disappoint his boss. Oh, 
He's yeah. like a livery driver. Boss Nance. Yeah, exactly. He crashed the boss's car. He basically crashed. I the crashed car. the boss's car. Boom the gasser. Yeah. <laughs> I stepped That's on awesome. the gas and crashed the boss's car. <laughs> but getting that out was crazy. You know, like you and definitely had like three or four spit takes in that day. Oh my God. And then, you know, you can see in the movie, if you watch the movie again, Liam is in the back like this, like trying his <laughs> hardest not to laugh. Like he's, he's, he's really trying hard. Like he's like looking around trying to be dignified. He's like shaking. Watch it again, you'll see him. Awesome. I had a lot of those moments with Liam. It became like a personal goal of mine to have Liam break character in, in, <laughs> while we were shooting. Cause he came from, he was just, he did Les Mis before he did uh, Phantom Menace. So he was coming right from Les Mis, which was like, not the musical, just like the serious Victor Hugo, like book that they adapted, right? And so he came into Phantom Menace, like very serious. And I was like, oh shit, these guys are like really super serious about this, but I don't give a shit. And so, like, the first day, <laughs> Liam and I mostly had most of our scenes together, right? Um, one of our first scenes was uh, the table scene, right? Where he, like, catches my tongue and all of that shit. And he's like, don't do that again. And I'm like, check, and I do this down a little bit, right? And then every take, he's breaking. I think he could not keep a straight face. And I was like, oh, you know, this is my goal now. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to get you right and it worked like every day i got him doing something and then i started doing like captain kirk in impressions and then um ewan does a really good scotty right so i was doing kirk and you was doing scotty and liam just couldn't take the both of them he like literally had to just beg us he was like please stop just stop just please. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't That's get dope. anything done. Like, That's amazing. We couldn't do anything. And Sam, you got some memories over there. What's your What's your defining prequel and double memory? Memory. Oh, just Just going to see those movies more times than I can count. I mean, I was just. It's. I mean, and that tradition has carried on to the Star Wars movies as they continue on. But you know, I just keep watching them because that was such a. At the time. Um, it's not like my life was going the way I had wanted it to particularly. I mean, I'll tell the, I'll tell this story. I, uh, me and my friends, we went to a uh, theater in Skokie, Illinois called Old Orchard oh. Theater and it's no longer there anymore. And so we went there the night before for the midnight screening of Phantom Menace and we saw it and we're like, whoa, wow, okay. And then we were gonna see it the next night for an opening night. So we had double opening nights. Opening night was the next night, but that morning at midnight, the morning of opening night, yeah. at, you know, right in the middle of the night, it, it opened for the people who waited in line. And, uh, and so we, we saw it. And the next day on opening night, I remember, um, because I'm, I'm like this kid who went to theater school in, I didn't know if I wanted to be an actor or not. And I didn't know even when I went to theater school if I wanted to be an actor or not. I had like long, messed up hair and um you know and i just was very uh, confused and maybe a little angry or whatever and and uh and then i was eventually asked to leave my theater school uh and i accepted i was like yeah totally whatever you know and uh so i had to figure out what what do i want to do and i think i had just decided that i wanted to be an actor i think i just decided and then it was how do you do that i'm i'm like i've i've in shame returned to my parents basement after getting kicked out of juilliard okay great <laughs> how do I be an actor? Oh, the, you know, I, this feels terrible. My life is going nowhere. Oh, there's a Star Wars movie coming out. Cool. Let's go see. Let's go do that. So I went there, saw the midnight screening. Then the next day, opening night, and there's this uh, there's this guy there that some people are gathering around, but a lot of people are just walking right past. And there's a table behind him. I'm looking at the guy. I'm like, he looks familiar. And then I look at the table behind him, and there's Darth Maul's lightsaber. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. that's Ray Park. That's Darth Maul. And people are walking by because they hadn't seen the movie yet. They didn't know this is the guy. You know, there were a few people coming up that were at the midnight screening that were like, you were awesome, dude. And 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 so we, me and my friends were, were among those people were like, oh my God, we'd love to shake your hand. And he's like, oh, hey, did you enjoy the performance? And I'm like, yes, it was amazing. That was so cool. And I remember looking at Ray Park and shaking his hand and he was talking to us. And I remember thinking, God, this guy's so lucky. Like, I don't even know how to begin to try to pursue 
my dream of becoming an actor or being in this business at all. And this guy is a master of, of his craft, jumping around and flipping. And, and how did he get to be in a Star Wars movie? This is amazing. And, and yeah, it was just a really, you know, it was, it was a bright spot in a hard time in my life. And I do kind of wish that I could go back 20 years and, you know, take myself aside and go, you know, in 20 years, you're going to voice that guy. He's going to become a friend of yours. You're going to, you're going to work together. That would have blown my mind. I would have been like, I would have just fell to the ground weeping. So Phantom Menace will always hold a very, very special place in my heart. I would watch it over and over and over again, trying to absorb every detail. And it was just, it, it turned um, a bad time into a really good time. It was great. I mean, I think that's what Star Wars has the magic to do. Um, it's one of those things, it's comfort, it's home. And I love the, the fact that you guys all love Star Wars so much. Like I love Star Wars and it meant so much to you. We're on like, we're on a group chat too, where we talk Star yeah. Wars on Twitter. Star we're Wars so family. Star Wars family mm -hmm. after since, since, since 17, right? Been, yeah, and yeah. I love it. I mean, I, for me, um, obviously my first memory was Star Wars. I was at a, I don't remember the movie, but I was at a drive-in theater with my family and my cousins. And they'd taken us, I think it was maybe like July or August in uh, 77 to see uh, a New Hope, and mm -hmm. it was a dusty parking lot. I just remember the excitement about the movie, but I don't remember the movie. And from then on, I could speak Star Wars words before I could speak normal human words. So I was this anomaly where my, my destiny was always fused with Star Wars. And then I got to direct a movie about Star Wars fans, which was a passion project of mine. And in that, I got to recreate the opening night of Phantom Menace, which was also a very big night in my life because I, I, was, I, I was just gotten out of film school, New York University, and I was the biggest Star Wars fan. I think there, everyone knew I was the Star Wars guy. And then, I, and then years later, I got to make this movie about Star Wars fans. And, and to recreate episode one opening night was special because that was like burned in my mind forever. Um, and it was like one of those things where which way is this all going to go? Like, is it going to, is it Star Wars going to keep growing? Or was that like lightning in a bottle? And I think that's the last line of the movie is like, what if it sucks? And for me, it was like, I know it doesn't suck, but I had to put that in there for some people because it's like, it was this thing that, you know, just some people left it behind and, and they didn't, the kid in them doesn't live on. Uh, but that was special, getting to recreate things out of Star Wars and getting to work with people. You know, like I got to work with Carrie Fisher. I got to work with uh, Billy D. Williams. I got to work with Ray Park. We got to work with, you know, George had my back making this movie when the studio wanted to change the movie and, and kind of disparage fans and, and go for an R rating. George called him and was like, no fucking way. He's like, no. Oh, I got Kyle's back. You know, he let me shoot at the ranch. I was like, this is like all a dream come true. I think I was the first person to shoot at Skywalker Ranch other than George or like a doc crew. He just let me go up there and shoot this movie. And of course, I, my ghetto production, we get up there and we have, um, I'm shooting at Skywalker Ranch, which is the culmination of this movie. It's like the, the emotional climax, the physical climax, everything's happening. And the Weinstein Company was so cheap, they wouldn't buy us lights. So we were lighting Skywalker Ranch up with car headlights. It was just like, it was a joke. But I was like, I'm here. I'm making this movie. Oh, cool. I dream of making this movie. And um, I'm getting to do justice to to Star Wars fandom and to other fans. And I think that that's special. The ending of doing, you know, opening night of episode one in the movie was was a testament to all that. So, yeah, it's, um, I mean, I mean, there's no, we always say it. And every time there's Star Wars takes a lull or, or disappears for a bit, you know, is Star Wars going to endure? Is Star Wars around? But Star Wars is forever. And, um, and, you know, it's so awesome talking about these movies with you guys. I think these movies are going to grow in um, esteem as time goes on. Uh, I think, you know, it was, they were just fused with immediate pop culture reaction. And in time, as the dust settles, I think people will, will place them accordingly. Phantom Menace especially, because as you were saying earlier, Ahmed, it's just this movie that has everything. All techniques in film history are displayed and embodied in this. And George is like this living um you know spirit of that history so i want to thank you guys all for coming to to talk about this i don't know where daniel is if he's just listening yeah, to the chat MIA. i don't know what happened yeah well daniel logan he's he, he was supposed to be part of this another a wonderful guy if you don't know him find him online he played uh young awesome. Boba Fett. he's doing uh, backflips man he's too he's busy doing backflips it's may the 4th <laughs> <laughs> and um where can we find all you guys online uh, at S, uh, what is it? Uh, at Sam Whitwer, uh, at Twitter, I think. I think Twitter, that's yeah. it. At Sam Whitwer. I think. Yeah, and I'm at Jennifer Muro on Twitter and official Jennifer Muro on Instagram. And that's probably good enough. 
Cool. <laughs> I am, um, where am I on Twitter? I am at Ahmed Best on Twitter and at Best Ahmed on Instagram. And I got a podcast called The Afrofuturist Podcast. Um, this Wednesday, I'm taking over the Twitter page for the Science and Entertainment Exchange. So if you got any science and entertainment questions, go look at that. I'll put a link in my, um, in my Twitter feed as well. Um, not on Facebook too much. I'm on LinkedIn at Ahmed Vest if you want to check me out on LinkedIn. Um, and um, I'm, also, I'm also at USC. Nice. Um, I'm at Claire Grant on all of the things and know why I'm Claire. <laughs> nice. I'm uh, Kyle underscore Newman on uh, Twitter and Instagram and um, Facebook. You can find me. I'm always down to throw down some Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> bring it. Um, right after this, I'm going to go on Rebel Force Radio. I've been there in a couple of years. I'm going there to talk about the uh, culmination of finale of Clone Wars. We'll be talking about you, Sam. Oh, no. So, uh, pop, over high. <laughs> pop over there right now. Thank you guys all for, for doing this. Thank you, everybody. Scum and Villainy Cantina. Um, somehow I became the de facto moderator. I know. It should be yeah. like, oh, oh, you did you're job. awesome, yeah. too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 You were really Why? great. You guys made this painless. You're, I love it. You're a director. It. You were you great. Yeah, I know. He directed us. Yeah. <laughs> right. Got to work with Sam. That's it's everything. Awesome. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> So yeah, thank you everybody for um, for tuning in. This is great. I know uh, who, who's next. Kevin Smith is up, I think, right? Yeah, he's waiting. Uh, sorry for to keep you waiting, the great Kevin Smith. I um, hope you're amused by our by us here talking about the prequels. Uh, good luck, everybody out there, and we will um, maybe see you next year. JC, are you doing this again? You better. If he's alive, yes. If he you can better, deal with JC. the pressure of this all over again. People want more Star Wars, JC. Yeah. Thank you all. Take care. Bye, guys. Thank you, guys.